Welcome to the July 2020 Central Arkansas Astronomy Astronomical Society meeting. I am going to mute everybody and uh, I'm going to unmute you, Daryl. And um, that way, if we do have chat, so if you have any questions uh, during Daryl's presentation, uh, go ahead and put those in the chat. All right, Daryl, you should be good to go. Okay. Um, all right. Can you all see that? We can. You can? Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right, uh, so I'm doing the Dead Astronomer of the Month uh, presentation, and uh, I would like to introduce you to Beatrice Tinsley, uh, the woman who chased galaxies, and she changed forever uh, some of our notions about cosmology and astronomy. And if you've never heard of her, I'm not too surprised, because uh, she died uh, when she was 40 years old. She, her career was just getting going. Uh, and even though she made this major contribution to astronomy, we all know uh, uh, her discovery, uh, but few of us associate her name with it. And it's only been within recent years uh, that she's kind of been making uh, a comeback or uh, people have been uh, kind of rediscovering her work and her and her life. So she was born on the 27th of January, 1941 uh, in Chester, England. I'm gonna advance to the next slide here. Uh, she was the middle of uh, three daughters born to Jean and Edward Hill. Uh, Edward was a, a minister and uh, following uh, World War II, uh, he uprooted the family and moved them from uh, England uh, to Christchurch, New Zealand. And that's where Beatrice uh, spent her childhood. Uh, in 1961, she finished off her degree, uh, her master's degree and bachelor's degree in physics at the University of Canterbury uh, in New Zealand. Now, after graduation, she marries uh, her uh, college sweetheart, uh, Brian Tinsley. And uh, he has just gotten his uh, PhD in physics at that time. But because there's very few jobs in physics at, uh, uh, in New Zealand, he has to uh, take a job in Dallas, Texas. So talk about a, uh, a change of scenery. Uh, they, they, they uproot and move from uh, New Zealand uh, to, to Dallas. And once they move there, Beatrice just kind of assumes this role of what she calls a, a, a mere Dallas housewife. And she begins to kind of bristle at the fact that uh, she has nothing to do but just kind of take care of the household. Uh, deep down, she's got this desire, this, this yearning uh, to go on, finish her, her, her uh, PhD, or get a PhD in astronomy. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a program at UT Dallas in astronomy. So she enrolls in uh, UT Austin. And she has to make a weekly drive, round trip of 400 miles in order to finish off that degree. So she uh, completes that. Uh, hold on, let's see. So she completes that program in just three years. And her thesis is the first in-depth look at how galaxies change in brightness and color over time as their compositions and rate of star birth changes over time as well. Now, up until that time, everyone kind of viewed galaxies as being these uh, static uh, objects. Uh, they didn't think that they changed very much uh, at all over time. And a lot of careers and reputations were built upon this uh, cornerstone assumption about uh, galaxies. And perhaps one of the most important ideas that rested upon this cornerstone, this fallacy that galaxies do not change, uh, was uh, in that they were being used as, as uh, 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 standard candles. So a standard candle, if you're not familiar with that, a uh, standard candle is where uh, astronomers uh, have, have a particular object which they know the brightness of, the absolute brightness, and they measure that against the apparent brightness, and then by applying uh, the uh, inverse square law of light, they can calculate the distance to that object. So one of those people that uh, did that was Alan Sandage, uh, a very well-known uh, astronomer at the time. In fact, he was probably uh, considered uh, the uh, top-ranking astronomer in the United States. He was kind of the successor to Edward, Edwin Hubble. Uh, and by this time in the 1960s, he's, uh, he's getting on in years, but he's still kind of considered the grand old man in astronomy. And he's working on uh, the fate of the universe. And he's relying 
on these standard candles of uh, elliptical galaxies to help uh, 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 inform him as to what the eventual fate of the universe is going to be. Now, at that time, there were uh, at least two po possibilities for the uh, eventual fate of the universe. Uh, one is that the universe is just going to keep expanding on and on forever and ever. And the other is that eventually uh, it will reach a point where it's just going to stop and all the combined gravitational uh, uh, mass of all the objects in the universe is, is going to cause a big crunch. Everything is just going to crash back in upon itself. And he was favoring that second idea. And he was using uh, the cosmological redshift of elliptical galaxies uh, to confirm his, his, his theories. Now, Beatrice and her work were showing that you couldn't rely on elliptical galaxies to do this. They were, uh, like any galaxy, they were prone to change over time. So you could not use uh, them as a standard candle. Now, Alan Sandage, uh, he publishes his work. Uh, he, gets, he gets a lot of notoriety and he gets invited to come to UT uh, to give a talk to a, a general audience, a public audience. And so he's there and the presentator, uh, 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 you know, introduces him and Beatrice, 26 years old, stands up and says, in no uncertain terms, I just think that you all should know that everything you're about to hear is wrong. And thus began a very long feud uh, between her and Alan Sandage. Uh, eventually, Alan Sandage did come around to the idea uh, that he was mistaken. And uh, uh, he had to uh, eventually uh, concede that uh, Beatrice was in fact right. Uh, her major professors declare her thesis to be both extraordinary and profound. Uh, she recognized, as I said, that galaxies are not static and they are comprised of various stellar populations and they change over time. And so therefore you can't use them as standard candles. Uh, she discovered that we could trace the general evolution of galaxies uh, by looking back in cosmic time. So she, uh, she says that uh, uh, if, we, if we look further back, if you take a particular galaxy type, like elliptical, elliptical galaxies, and you trace them back uh, through uh, cosmic time, you'll see that they do in fact change. And this, of course, uh, is, is, is true. We, we now know this, but we didn't at the time that she was completing her thesis. She also confirmed this by using computer modeling uh, to demonstrate how galaxies evolve over time. Today, computer modeling is just a standard tool that astronomers use, but Beatrice was there. If not the very first, she was one of the earliest people to use computer modeling. And, and we're talking about really simple computers back in those days, but she was using computer modeling uh, to show how galaxies evolve over time. She also realizes that galaxies are are not static in that they also interact with their immediate environment. So galaxies can interact with one another and uh, uh, they can change over time simply by uh, colliding and merging with one another. Um, so by showing us how galaxies change and evolve over time, she undermines that major pillar of cosmology that using galaxies as standard candles uh, uh, was not something that we could rely on. So, so we kind of covered that. Um, after she uh, uh, got, got her PhD and, you would, and had made this really major contribution in cosmology and astronomy, you would think that she would be able to get a job just anywhere. And um, that wasn't the case though. She had to go spend several more years as a housewife again, simply because, uh, uh, mainly because women at that time uh, were really just still not allowed uh, into the field. Uh, it was still pretty much male dominated. So she really had to fight uh, to get anywhere uh, as, in a, with a career in astronomy. So she spent several years, uh, once again, being a housewife. Uh, she and Brian had adopted a couple of daughters and she spent a lot of time uh, uh, raising uh, the kids. Uh, she got involved in things like, a, she was a musician, so she got involved in a local orchestra. Uh, she became an activist and, and Planned Parenthood and a bunch of other things. But she's still very unhappy. I mean, she's got this PhD and she wants to be able to pursue a career in astronomy. Finally, several years later, there's an opportunity at Yale University. She applies for the job, she gets it. Um, and she's forced to have to make a decision. She either stays as a housewife in Dallas or she uproots and moves to Yale and leaves her family behind. 
she and Brian, uh, their relationship has kind of crumbled at this point. Um, but she decides she wants the career, so she moves on. This is a decision that's going to haunt her for the rest of her life. Um, so she takes the job and becomes the first female astronomer at, at Yale. And uh, she works there for a few years, and then she contracts in 1979 uh, uh, melanoma. And she eventually dies after a long struggle with it at, uh, in 1981 at the age of 40. Uh, okay, I'm going to quit here, but before I, I let, let you go, I just want to read you a little bit of a poem that she wrote um, before her death. And she says, let me be like Bach, creating fugues, till suddenly the pen will move no more. Let all my themes within of ancient light, of origins and change and human worth, let all their melodies still intertwine, evolve and merge with growing unity, ever without fading, ever without a final chord, till suddenly my mind can hear no more. So after her death, Beatrice's name kind of falls into obscurity. And uh, it's only been in recent years, as I said earlier, that she's kind of been, uh, has seen a renaissance and uh, people are discovering her once again. And we now have a multitude of honors that bear her name. There's everything from scholarships and prizes and awards. There's a mountain in New Zealand that's been named after and even an asteroid. Uh, so our understanding of galaxies, the expansion of the universe, its size and its eventual fate has changed a great deal of the years since her death. But that understanding would not have been what it is without the work and attitude of Beatrice Tinsley. Thank you. That was really great, Daryl. Thank you very much. Uh, Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, we have Dr. Dan and Dr. Julia Kenefick who are also uh, going to present tonight and we'll uh, let them hand off to each other at the appropriate points in, in their uh, presentations. They're both, uh, they both teach at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville, and I will turn it over to y'all. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> let me begin by saying uh, the, what a great talk that was that we just heard. I must admit, maybe with a little embarrassment, that I knew essentially nothing of Beatrice Tinsley's uh, life and work, and that was really fascinating. Um, so I also just spoke with Julia, I, I think, you know, in view of time constraints and so on, probably the simplest thing is if I just present tonight and you can also have Julia another time, it, it so happens that she's had a pretty hectic week at work anyway, so I think it might be what suit her to <laughs> present at a different time. Uh, and in any case, I've got plenty to talk about. So um, uh, as we like to say in our family, I'm not a real astronomer. Uh, Julia's the real astronomer. I, uh, I guess... I sort of count as a gravitational wave astronomer now that that's a real thing, but I, I'm a theorist and I never look through telescopes. Uh, but I am interested in the history of astronomy. And uh, one time that got me on the television and uh, it was about uh, the subject we're going to talk about, the, that I'm going to talk about here, the 1919 eclipse expedition. So it was astronomy and the TV company put under my face on the screen, Daniel Kenefick, astronomer. And Julie was highly amused by this. And so after that, she took to introducing me by saying, this is my husband. He's not an astronomer, but he does play one on TV. So, um, that, so that's me. I'm going to be playing an astronomer tonight. Uh, so I wrote this book about the 1919 eclipse expeditions to uh, appear, appeared last year for the centenary of the expeditions. And you probably are familiar with the basic story uh, that these were expeditions that tested Einstein's theory of general relativity. And it's the results of these uh, these expeditions that made Einstein the celebrity that he is and remains to this day. Uh, it so happens, and I guess I'll talk about this as we go along, that over the years, especially in the last few decades, there's been quite a bit of criticism of the expedition's science, and a lot of it aimed especially at the most famous of the expeditionaries, Arthur Stanley Eddington. And I, oh, my dog is worried that we're under attack. Um, I, uh, I must say, uh, I'm totally unconvinced by many of these charges, and so a good part of the book and a good part of what I'm going to talk about tonight is, a, as it were, a defense of the expeditionaries. And one of the key parts of it is 
to realize, uh, just as we already heard, a lot of people have forgotten Beatrice Tinsley, a lot of people have forgotten many of the astronomers who did the work in 1919. It's not like Eddington wasn't involved, he was, but there were others. And one of the dangers of focusing on the famous people is that you forget the work done by the rest and you're prone to assume that the, that the, that the main guy did all the work when that isn't true. So we'll, we'll see how that plays into it. Uh, okay, well, I'm gonna start by showing a picture of one of the two eclipse sites, uh, Sobral in northeastern Brazil uh, on the date of the eclipse. So we can see here, some of the astronomers are here, although I think none of the ones from the English expedition are here. Um, but uh, there were also expeditions from Brazil and some American geophysicists were there. So I think, I think this is actually where they were set up, but it gives you an idea of the scene. And you'll notice incidentally how cloudy it is. And that is certainly gonna play a role in our discussion. Uh, so the centenary was last year. Um, now, of course, we're, it's a year later. Uh, this would have been, of course, a century ago, the period of you know, controversy over the results. There was a lot of debate. There was a lot of back and forth. Many people were unhappy with the results of the expedition. There were people who were very skeptical of Einstein's theory. Uh, there were people who felt that the uh, results weren't as decisive as, as, as to really uh, confirm the theory. And of course, as we know, it had to be done during an eclipse and you have to wait for the next eclipse. So unusually in science, you couldn't just go straight into the lab and decide matters that way. So you basically had to argue it out. And there was quite a bit of argument. And of course, it was just after World War I, I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, and that meant that there was some bitterness, right? Because here was a German scientist and uh, here was an English uh, team of astronomers who had been the enemy, they'd been enemies in World War I. And there was some resentment about Einstein amongst people who were uh, angry at Germany, uh, blaming Germany for the war and so on. Uh, okay. <clears throat> The uh, expedition left from this building, uh, the Royal Observatory at Greenwich, uh, in March of 1919. Uh, the, uh, well, I'll talk more about the people here in a minute, but the expedition was uh, organized by two different uh, English observatories and the leading part was played by this observatory, uh, the Greenwich Observatory. Um, now, the purpose of the expedition as Eddington put it, Eddington, of course, was a really brilliant popularizer of science and he had a gift for a phrase. And so he said, what we're doing is we're gonna weigh light. We're gonna show that light has weight, which was a very revolutionary idea at the time. In the 19th century, of course, physicists and astronomers thought of light as a wave. And it therefore wasn't uh, like matter. It didn't have mass and therefore it didn't have weight. And Einstein, in several different ways attacked this idea in the early 20th century. And he, he ended up by developing this theory of general relativity in which he said, yeah, light, the light will definitely fall in a gravitational field. And that means it will be deflected from its path. And that means that you will have, uh, well, for one thing, it means you will have what we would now call gravitational lensing, which is also an idea of Einstein's. And so that of course is something that's been in the news in the last year or so, in fact, about the same time as the centenary. Uh, and so gravitational lensing is a consequence of this prediction of Einstein's theory. And although, of course, the sun isn't powerful enough to do any real lensing, what we're seeing here, of course, is an Einstein ring around a distant black hole, supermassive black hole from the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, nevertheless, the, uh, this was the proof of concept, this expedition of 1919. Uh, here's maybe a more clear-cut image, but of course, this is a... This is a an artistic rendering for the movie Interstellar, but again, you'll see there the Einstein ring. What we're seeing here in the big circle around the black hole is in fact the rear of that accretion disk hid that would normally be hidden from you behind a black hole if a black hole was like a physical object. But here, yeah, we can't see it through the black hole, but the black hole bends the light above and below it. So the light from the disk behind the black hole is visible above and below the black hole making this ring, which is known as an Einstein ring because it was Einstein who first showed that this is how gravitational lens work. Uh, here's another example of a beautiful gravitational lens. And I, I'm sure that with this audience, uh, you, I don't need to remind you that nowadays this is a major tool in, in, in astronomy and cosmology because of course the lensing effect focuses the light from distant galaxies. And so if as in this picture, you have a foreground galaxy and then a distant galaxy behind, the light, of course, is distorted. That's why we have this Einstein ring, but it is also focused. And so you can see 
the more distant galaxy, which is here visible as that blue ring, uh, more than you would, where you would normally not be able to see it at all. So many of the most distant galaxies that we can see, we can see because of gravitational wind. Uh, and here's a, a simple schematic of how it works. Uh, we have the observer here is off on the right side of the screen. On the left is the object we're looking at. Yellow is the actual object itself, which is emitting light. In between us, there's a massive object, which is that little pur purple circle. And you'll see that the light, as it passes close by the object, falls towards it, deflected from its path. And so we naturally, our eyes and our telescopes, assume straight line, linear light motion. And so we think that the position of the uh, star is other than it is. In this case, we get the Einstein ring. But here is a drawing of what we get in the case of sunlight. And this drawing is by Einstein himself. This is a letter written by Einstein in 1913 to the distinguished American astronomer, George Ellery Hale. Einstein knew that Hale had the best telescopes in the world, and of course was an expert in solar astronomy. And he had made this prediction, so he wondered if stars were shifted from their positions when they were seen close to the sun. But of course, Einstein knew enough about astronomy to know that you can't see stars in the daylight. Uh, and so, it did occur to him, well, I suppose maybe you could do this experiment during eclipse. But then, of course, he realized that that means travel and complication. So here he is writing to uh, Hale in, in German. And he, first of all, explains what's going on to Hale. And so that's the image that I drew your attention to. Here on the left, we have a star. Uh, the word Stern, German for star, is under it. In the middle is the Sonne, the sun. The light is passing by the sun and is deflected. And the amount of the deflection is the amount by which the star will be shifted in its position see, when seen close to the sun compared to its usual position. And at the bottom of the letter, he says, um, can we do this? And by Tage, if you see the words underlined at the bottom, during the daytime, ones sun and finsterness without a solar eclipse. So he says, is it possible that we could do this without the eclipse? Because he, he was having trouble persuading astronomers to go to all the trouble. Astronomers liked to go to eclipses at this time, but they did other things and they maybe weren't queuing up to just do what Einstein asked them to do. And of course, Hale wrote back and said, no, you, you're gonna have to do this in an eclipse and made some suggestions of people Einstein might want. So let's talk about some of these early efforts. Um, obviously, total solar eclipses, they do take place pretty regularly, but they're not always total. Uh, eclipses, solar eclipses, not always total. Um, so sometimes you'll have to wait two or three years. And again, the location may be very, uh, may be very uh, inconvenient. So uh, the very first expedition was by this man, led by this man, uh, Charles Perrine. He was an American astronomer uh, who, however, was director of the Argentinian National Observatory. And he went to an eclipse in 1912 in Brazil and was totally rained out. Uh, his later remark was, we suffered a total eclipse instead of observing one. And uh, he then, um, I mean, he then more or less leaves the picture, unfortunately. He never really got the, the resources together to make another attempt. Uh, but it, luckily in 1914, there was to be an eclipse visible in Europe. So much more convenient for most of the observatories of the day. Uh, and in particular, this man, Erwin Finlay Freundlich, who was a young, still at that time, relatively young German astronomer, who had been the most enthusiastic astronomer in taking up Einstein's suggestion of doing this experiment. And so Einstein raised the money for Freundlich to go to Russia, where the eclipse would be visible from. In fact, the Crimea was the station he had selected. And uh, by August 1914, the uh, date of the eclipse was August 21st, 1914. By early August 1914, Freundlich was in Russia with his companions, with his equipment, and what could go wrong? Well, if you know a little of your uh, 20th century European history, you'll know that August 1914 was the month that World War I broke out. And of course, Freundlich was German, and the war was essentially a war between Russia and Germany. So Freundlich was arrested. This was typical at the time. I know that here in the United States, there is a great deal of, of heartfelt you know, um, uh, uh, regret about interning Japanese uh, at the beginning of World War II. But it has to be said, European countries just did this as a matter of course. So Freundlich was just arrested, uh, jailed, his equipment was confiscated, um, and he, he really got off to a very unlucky start in what turned out to be in a very unlucky career as an eclipse astronomer. He went 
to five sub subsequent eclipses uh, in order to try to uh, test Einstein's theory, and he was clouded out on four of those occasions. So he went one for six in his career. So this was uh, unfortunately uh, just a taste of what was to come as far as Freundlich was concerned. Um, I do put the picture up here is in fact, uh, just to show that he, he was not a failure, uh, he later parlayed the great publicity around the 1919 eclipse expedition into funding to build this beautiful solar observatory and near Berlin in Potsdam, from which he could test another one of Einstein's predictions. Uh, it's of course a landmark of modernist architecture and history of astronomy. Um, one other great thing that he did in 1914 was that he really convinced an American team from the Lick Observatory in Northern California uh, that this was an interesting topic. And although they were clouded out and maybe didn't have time to really get set up for this anyway, they would prove to be an important part of the story later on. Uh, the director of the Lick Observatory was this man, William Wallace Campbell. Uh, in 1918, the, uh, we just had fairly recently, of course, an eclipse that crossed the United States from west to east. The previous time that happened was this eclipse in 1918, and Campbell wanted to observe it. He was an inveterate eclipse astronomer. Here was one happening in his backyard. Unfortunately, Although he wasn't arrested in 1914, uh, he wasn't obviously in, in involved in the war being an American at that time, and in any case later was an ally of Russia, but he did find that it was impossible to bring his equipment home with him because the Russians had better things to do with their shipping in the middle of a war than ship telescopes around. So uh, he discovered that he wasn't able to get his equipment back in 1918. Uh, he didn't recover it until after the eclipse. And that meant he had to use whatever he could cobble together. The equipment wasn't great. The weather wasn't that great either. Uh, and unfortunately, this great opportunity was essentially missed. They did take some data, but they never found it to be sufficiently accurate or precise to actually publish. And so again, uh, a difficult uh, experience which ended in frustration. Okay, well, the 1919 eclipse was different. Uh, the first thing that's different about it is that it's a perfect location in the heavens. On May 29th, the sun is in the star field of the Hyades cluster. And of course, that's the closest open stellar cluster to the Earth. And so there's an unusually rich field of bright stars. And that, of course, is what you want. You want to be able to image stars close to the sun, and you would like them to be bright to help with that. And so uh, when the English astronomers started to get interested in this, and this started uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but, but just to give you the, the two most important names, I've already mentioned Eddington, and he was the first one in England to really appreciate the value of Einstein's new theory when it was published in 1916. And he interested the Astronomer Royal, uh, Frank Watson Dyson, we're going to talk more about, uh, in doing this experiment. And Dyson immediately, or at least pretty quickly, said to him, well, if you want to do this, 1919 is your year, because the star field will be so appropriate. And so they began to, to plan for that. Uh, well, unfortunately, if, if, the time, if, the time, if the location and the timing was good in the heavens, it wasn't on the Earth. World War I was raging uh, still as they began their planning. Uh, and it was, of course, a very bitter war, a great antagonism between the two sides, including between scientists, because, of course, this was the first, I think it's fair to say, maybe the first war in which scientists were playing this important role, introduction of poison gas, of course, being a particularly sore point for allied scientists against their German colleagues. Um, and in any case, regardless of the bitterness, just the fact that the resources weren't there to mount an expedition. Shipping, for instance, wasn't available uh, because ships had been commandeered for the war. So again, the same problem that had been experienced in getting equipment back from Russia is a matter of fact, although I won't go into it in any detail, I'll just mention briefly, the British had also had to leave equipment in Russia, so they were also handicapped, like the Americans had been, in getting together equipment for this eclipse expedition. Well, okay, uh, however, in the end, the British did win the war, so you can regard the fact that they were the only country, apart, uh, apart from the Brazilians, the eclipse was in, in their country, to make an a mountain expedition for astronomical purposes. Um, and so, uh, they, uh, I suppose this was sort of, as it were, the spoils of victory. Um, notice, of course, they were going to be testing the theory of a, of a leading German scientist. And if they were successful, that German scientist theory was going to eclipse, I suppose is the word, 
the, the theory of Isaac Newton, the most famous English scientist. Uh, so keep in mind the bitterness, you know, that there might potentially be some uh, bitterness about this whole course of events. And you must remember that after the war, scientists supported a very strict boycott of German scientists. When the International Astronomical Union was founded in 1919, as, as the eclipse expeditions were, were still in train, uh, they did not include Germany. German scientists were ostracized after the war. Now, by a very odd coincidence, both Einstein and Eddington, two of the, the two most famous figures involved in the eclipse, were both anti-war activists, they were both pacifists, so in some level, that seems to have been part of a narrative which really touched people, uh, obviously war-weary as people were. The idea that here was science rising above the war and the two leading scientists were both men of peace does seem to have caught the public imagination. And the idea that this was a reconciliation after a bitter time uh, was undoubtedly one of the reasons why the Eclipse expedition would have caught the public imagination. Well, uh, here are the two men I just spoke of, Einstein and Eddington. This picture was taken later in around 1930, I think. Uh, and it's in the garden of the Cambridge Observatory where Eddington was the director. So there were two observatories who mounted two expeditions in 1919. Eddington was the director of the Cambridge Observatory and therefore led one of the expeditions. Dyson, who I've already mentioned, was the director of the Royal Observatory Greenwich, and he was the leader and organizer of the other expedition, though he in the end did not go on it, probably because he had to attend this inaugural meeting of the International Astronomical Union. Um, so one important point to note is that Eddington and Einstein really got along well. Uh, they had never met at this time, but they both, I think, were aware at some stage in this whole process that each was a pacifist, a, a war, anti-war person, a somebody who opposed conscription and so on. So similar political beliefs, uh, similar scientific background, scientific interests, and they both uh, were very fond of Einstein's theory. And so the charge is made that Eddington was biased. And in particular, that he negligently threw out data which didn't fit his preconception. And I'm going to argue rather strongly against that view. I think that it's a wrong headed view. So let's talk a little bit about it. First of all, it's a view that has been put forward quite a few times. I'm, I'm curious uh, afterwards if anybody has gotten this impression from uh, uh, reading uh, about the eclipse in, in, in past decades. Uh, here's an example from one book which does take this view that Eddington was biased. Here's what readers of Amazon, readers of the book on Amazon had to say about it. Uh, shock, Eddington's observations were worthless. Uh, fit the, the theory, data fit the theory rather than the other way around. Uh, Eddington was a dab hand at faking results. So, I mean, they've gotten the impression from reading this book that, that Eddington was frankly a fraud. Well, that, that's completely wrong, but I'm going to argue that, that actually the whole thing really doesn't make any sense once you examine it. So, uh, so first of all, a few things to note. Uh, well, it's okay. It's all very well to say they were both pacifists, but keep in mind how unpopular their positions were at that time. You know, obviously, even today, somebody who is opposed to conscription and totally opposed to war can find themselves at odds with public opinion. Obviously, we, we're all familiar with the phrase, support our troops. That was a big thing in, in World War I. Um, and the fact that people like Eddington and Einstein were not perceived to be supporting the troops meant that they were, um, in many cases, persona non grata. And Eddington, in particular, risked jail for his refusal to be conscripted. So let's not, you know, let's not slide easily into the idea, oh, that they, they knew that everybody would love them because they were pacifists. That wasn't really their experience. And furthermore, even, perhaps even more importantly, okay, it is true that Eddington was an admirer of Einstein's theory, but again, don't let that kid you into thinking that most astronomers were. As a matter of fact, he was almost unique amongst astronomers. We know that many astronomers were really antagonistic if they knew about Einstein's theory at all, didn't much like it, and um, as we shall see, even some of the people involved in the expedition were somewhat skeptical. So again, Eddington was an outlier. It's fine to talk about him being biased, but first of all, if we're gonna talk about his bias, some of the other people were clearly biased the other way. Uh, and uh, it's hard to imagine if he was the only one biased in the one direction, how he could steam, stampede everybody else into following his lead. So we have to ask ourselves how that all happened and, and take the basic story that we're being given here with a little bit of a grain of salt. 
let's uh, examine in Eddington's own words what his expectations were. Uh, this is written just before setting out on the eclipse uh, expeditions. I have sometimes wondered what must have been the feelings of Professor Michelson when his wonderfully designed experiment failed to detect the expected signs of our velocity through the ether. Yet now we see that a positive result would have been a very tame conclusion. And the negative result has started a new stream of knowledge revolutionizing the fundamental concepts of physics. A null result is not necessarily a failure. The present eclipse expeditions may for the first time demonstrate the weight of light, or they may confirm Einstein's weird theory of non-Euclidean space, or they may lead to a result of yet more far-reaching consequences, no deflection. So I won't go into the background to this statement too much, but I will observe, first of all, Eddington, at least oh, as far as his public pronouncement goes before he set off was, I'm open to anything. Uh, and even if he says, yes, it would be difficult to explain light not having weight, but he does say, well, maybe that's what we need to do, right? If that's the result, then that's the result. Um, of course, a key problem is that because Eddington is very, very famous, not on Einstein's level, but still pretty famous as astronomers go, everybody kind of assumes that he was just in charge. And he was not actually the senior man, Dyson was. And they also tend to focus on the place he went to because he was there, and they assume that the important data was taken there. I've definitely met people who just assume that must have been the case, and that wasn't true either. The key data was taken at Sobral, the place that I showed you the picture of before. And, and Eddington never set foot in the place. Uh, so these are the two men, uh, Eddington on the right, Dyson on the left, they were very friendly. Uh, they knew each other very well. Dyson had once been Eddington's boss. Um, Dyson, as I say, he was the senior man in British astronomy at the time. He was the astronomer royal. Uh, he was the director, or the, the chair, I guess is really the word I'm looking for, of the Joint Permanent Eclipse Committee, which was the English committee uh, which organized eclipse expeditions. So he was actually in charge. Uh, it's completely wrong-headed to imagine that Eddington was in charge. Of course, Dyson co-opted Eddington onto the committee. They were in many ways co-equals. Uh, Dyson very much admired Eddington. Uh, he wouldn't have been all surprised to find that uh, Eddington was famous and everybody had largely forgotten his contribution. He said to his daughter in later life, if I'm remembered at all, he said, it will be because I was once Eddington's boss. He knew that Eddington was this brilliant guy. He was a brilliant person. So these two men were uh, involved in organizing the uh, expeditions through the um, medium of this Joint Permanent Eclipse Committee. This was a committee jointly sponsored, as its name implies, by the Royal Society of London and the Royal Astronomical Society. And Dyson, as I said, was the chair. This is Burlington House in London. Uh, at the time, it was the headquarters of both of these societies. So the meetings could would be maybe alternately in one society or the other, but it was the same building. Um, and uh, I've been in this building for the uh, centenary last year of the announcement of the results. I was very fortunate to get to give a talk uh, in this building because the Royal Astronomical Society is still housed there. The Royal Society has moved a short distance away. And, uh, and as I mentioned, there were two observatories involved. Uh, this is the picture of the front of the Cambridge Observatory, now part of the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. Uh, so we have two directors, two observatories, two expeditions, and Though they were um, organized to some extent together under the umbrella of JPEG, nevertheless, they were quite separate in other ways. And they had their own equipment. They analyzed the data separately. They did their own data analysis. And that's something that's important to look on that. Now, I need to start uh, telling you about where the eclipse ran, where its track was. Uh, first, I'm going to show you this rather famous illustration from the London Illustrated News. Uh, and it shows a small map, I'll show you a bigger one in a moment. So you'll see that the eclipse track ran through tropical regions of South America and Africa. And uh, they chose a observing station in each place, one in Brazil, one on the coast of, off the coast of West Africa. Dyson's team went to Brazil. Eddington went to Principe, this island off the coast of West Africa. And, and here you see a little drawing of the scene in Sobral, and you see a picture of the eclipse and uh, some attempt to explain to the readers uh, back in 1919 what the science was all about. Um, so why did they pick these two locations? Well, uh, the way things worked in those days was you used a uh, vessel had, had shown how you could precisely calculate the path of an eclipse. Um, there was a man called Arthur Hinks 
who was an astronomer turned geographer, so he was perfect for this job. And he, it was, who worked out the path and drew it on a map accurately. And then what you would do is you would look for places which had either a port or a train going through it so you could get there with your heavy equipment. And Sobral in northeastern Brazil, which is shown here on the map, was more or less a no-brainer. Uh, you'll notice that a good deal of the track crosses the Atlantic Ocean, so that's not good. Uh, much of the rest of the track crosses the world's two great jungle basins. You've got the Amazon and the Congo. That's no good either. And so Sobral was really about the only place uh, in any reasonable part of the eclipse track. Incidentally, you also don't want to pick either end of the eclipse track because then you will be seeing the eclipse with the sun too low on the horizon. So, so Brow was really the only option. Uh, the only other place they could find was this island, Principe. Uh, not a very uh, infrastructurally advanced place, but at least it was an island with a small port, so you could in principle just land right there and you were there. And that's why they picked these two locations. And obviously they wanted two locations so that maybe if the weather was bad in one, they would be okay in the other. And ideally, of course, for such an important experiment, you'd like that it would have two sets of results reinforcing each other. And here is shown the, uh, how they got there by ship. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that, and maybe it's the next slide, in fact. No, I, I, I'm talking about Arthur Hinks, um, but I won't say too much about him uh, since I already said a little bit just now. Uh, and the outbound trips, uh, they all began their journey on this ship, the Anselm. This is a postcard that would have been for sale on the ship, uh, probably at this time. Um, this all took place just barely in time for them to go. The, the war ended in November 1918. Ships were then released gradually back to duty for civilian purposes. When the Anselm sailed with them on board for Brazil, it was actually the first time that a ship had resumed on that route from England to Brazil after the war. So had the war lasted any further uh, time, it would have been impossible for them to go. So uh, the, everything went fortunately for them. There were, of course, plenty of hiccups, but still, uh, it was dicey that they would have been able to, to do it at all. Uh, this is a picture of Sobral, but Sobral today, there's a monument to the eclipse. Uh, that's the monument right in front of us there. Uh, last year, I did get to visit Sobral. I wasn't there for the actual centenary, but I did get to visit and give a talk, and it was uh, actually a, a beautiful place. Although at the time, it was not as green as we see here because they were actually undergoing a drought. So the eclipse, uh, they arrived about a month in advance. Eddington actually had the most terrible time getting there. Um, all sorts of difficulties because of wartime difficulties. He actually took the ship going to Brazil, but he got out at the island of Madeira. If I go back to the map, you can see here that uh, in mid-Atlantic there, the island of Madeira was where he left the ship heading for Brazil that took the other expedition onward. And uh, he had no idea how he would get from there to Principe. He just had to look for a ship to take him. And, and luckily, one did come by in time. So they all got there about a month in advance. And they were well ready when the eclipse did actually happen. Uh, here's a picture of the uh, expedition in Sobral. These are two astronomers from Dyson's staff at the Royal Observatory. Uh, they're the men in white right in the middle. One is Charles Davidson, an English astronomer, actually a computer originally, someone who did the calculations, and uh, Andrew Cromlin, an Irish astronomer. And if I go on to the next page, just to tell you a little bit about them, they were both at this time assistants at the Royal Observatory, though Davidson had started as a computer. Um, there's Davidson with Dyson. They actually were very close. Uh, Dyson really trusted and valued Davidson. And even though in principle he had started out in a, with a lowly position and he was not a college educated person, because he was brilliant with equipment, he was vital to the whole expedition. And in fact, the mirror that you see in this picture with them uh, was a mirror that went to Sobral in 1919. And in fact, was critical to taking the VIT data. Um, it was, uh, this is uh, however from a later eclipse uh, preparation. And uh, Cromlin was an Irish astronomer. He, his actual area of expertise was comets. He was really a last minute substitution uh, for the eclipse expeditions for this man, Father Aloysius Corky, who'd actually donated the, um, that mirror that we saw, some of the key equipment he donated. But then he was unable to go, couldn't get to leave from his job, and so Cromlin went instead. Well, on the day of the eclipse, uh, this is the uh, scene at uh, today at the cocoa plantation in 
Principe, where Eddington was based. It's now actually a guest house. I believe you can stay there uh, if you ever get all the way to Principe, which is kind of a remote location. I've never been. Um, Eddington encountered, they both encountered poor weather. Eddington in particular had very poor weather. Clouds thinned right at the end of the eclipse and he got a, couple, a few star images on a couple of late plates. And that was all he had to go on. And at Sobral, they were lucky, uh, but Eddington was, uh, but Dyson, I'm sorry, who wasn't there, but his team was there, was always lucky with eclipses. He was the opposite to Freundlich. He went on uh, also six eclipse expeditions and was never clouded out once. Uh, and here's a seventh, he wasn't on this one, but again, you know, this, I'm told, I'm told by my Brazilian colleagues that this is a picture of the scene just before second contact, just before totality. You can see that there's heavy cloud. It had been covering the sun all morning. And you can see that there's a hole there. And that hole is about to park itself over the eclipse just after, just at the time of second contact. So they actually had clear weather just for the eclipse. So they were strikingly lucky. Unfortunately, they had two telescopes with them, one of which they noticed almost immediately when they um, developed the plates, actually had had poor quality images because of some astigmatism, possibly in the mirror, the, the Celestat mirror that was used. Uh, and, and that is a central part of our story. I can't resist telling you a little bit about the history of the equipment, uh, although it means that I won't end up telling you too much about the data analysis, but I think this is probably more interesting. Um, so obviously equipment critical to this uh, experiment. And interestingly enough, almost everything was made by the man that you see here. His name was Howard Grubb. Uh, he was Irish. Uh, I should mention that. You may notice I keep mentioning that people are Irish, so I'm Irish uh, originally too. And uh, Grubb was a very uh, influential Dublin uh, telescope maker. And he made the two astrographic telescopes that were the kind of, that were brought one by each expedition. And, but he also made a smaller lens, which was brought and which was actually owned by an Irish, uh, by the Royal Irish Academy, it was on loan to the expeditions. And he, uh, uh, he his, so his work was, was sort of critical. Um, and uh, it's quite an interesting story about the equipment. Uh, the key point that I want you to keep in mind is that there were three telescopes used, one on Principe, where it worked fine, but of course they didn't get that much data because of the clouds. And then two telescopes that were used uh, at Sobral, one, both made by Grubb, the lenses were both made by Grubb, uh, but the astrographic lens, that telescope didn't work very well. The four inch lens on the other hand got good data. And so the, what was done with the, with the bad data from the astrographic lens is the key point of disagreement. So we'll at least get as far as me telling you the, the what, what, what was the case with that? But uh, I mentioned I was Irish. Uh, while writing this book, I actually was on sabbatical at my hometown of Cork, but this is my home university. The observatory there was built by Grubb and all the equipment was made by Grubb and it is still in the condition it was at this time. So it was very useful to be there and to be able to see the equipment and, you know, in its original setting and, and how it would have been used and so on. Um, this, however, is what you have with you on the eclipse. You can't bring all the mounting and so they use celestat mirrors, and then the tubes of the telescopes don't actually move at all. And these are the two instruments used at Sobral. The one on the left is the astrographic that didn't do well. The one with the square tube on the right is the four inch that actually was really a backup instrument. But Father Corty, who had used these instruments before, warned them that the one he thought was more reliable was the four inch and that they should take it. And they, happily, they took his advice. Well, a very Prominent feature of the eclipse of 1919 was a beautiful solar prominence, a really huge one that was ongoing, a flare that was ongoing during the eclipse. And so they got some spectacular images of that. So of course, that wasn't what they went to see, but it, it's of course the pretty image from the eclipse. Um, now, what was it that Einstein claimed? Well, in 1911, he predicted that light should be deflected, but he thought of it only in terms of falling. And he said that the amount of the deflection would be less than an arc second, even close to the sun. However, when he finished his theory, his theory, final version of his theory, proposed that gravity curves spacetime. And if you know something about curved geometry, uh, such as the Earth, you know that the straightest distance between two points on a curved surface is not, in fact, a straight line. Uh, and so that adds an extra amount of deflection. And in fact, 
you get 1.75 seconds of arc for his the final version of his theory. Uh, now, then, as you as I say, the myth goes then that Eddington was so convinced uh, that he that he somehow fudged the data. Now, there are several problems with this, and I'll just give you those those main problems, and then we'll we'll, we'll throw it open to questions. Uh, first of all, um, just to Cantor uh, is telling this story. Um, here is, uh, incidentally, a picture is Dyson and Eddington together in later years. You can see they were, they were friendly. Um, they were all together on the night of departure back at uh, the Royal Observatory. Uh, Eddington's companion was a man called um, Cottingham, Edwin Turner Cottingham, who was not an astronomer, but a clockmaker. I've often wondered why Eddington took a clockmaker with him. And the answer turns out to be a sad one. He, of course, had astronomers who were assistants at the Cambridge Observatory, but none of them survived the war. They all died while on active service during the war. So he brought Cottingham with him. And of course, Cottingham wasn't a, uh, wasn't a scientist. So Dyson and Eddington undertook on the night before departure to explain to him what was at, ba at, at stake with the theoretical uh, possibilities. I already briefly touched on them. There's the possibility that light is unaffected by gravity, so no deflection. There's that half deflection that Einstein proposed, and then there's the later the full deflection. And Cottingham definitely got the idea that the, the bigger the deflection, the more exciting it would be. And so he then asked, what if we get twice that value? And then Dyson replied, then Eddington will go mad and you will have to come home alone. And later Cottingham said that after Eddington measured the first plates still on the island, he turned and said, Cottingham, you won't have to go home alone. So they, they, they liked a bit of a joke between themselves. Well, okay, so we have some results. Once they've done all the data analysis, um, what results did they get? Uh, there were, as I said, three theoretical predictions that they were testing. The Sobral expedition quoted the following results. For that four inch lens from Dublin, 1.98. You'll notice that that's actually even bigger than, than what Einstein had predicted with the full deflection. So that's consistent with the theory of general relativity. The astrographic lens, on the other hand, got less than an arc second. So that's actually more um, consistent with that half result, which Eddington used to call the Newtonian prediction. Uh, and then the other expedition got 1.61. And so that's much closer to the Einstein prediction. So the problem that people have pointed out is, well, here you have three instruments, but only two of them agree with Einstein. The third one agrees with Newton. Why did they come down so much in favor of Einstein? Wasn't that all Eddington's bias? And the answer is no. Uh, that's the charge. I think I've said that. First of all, it turns out that it wasn't Eddington who made this key decision, right? That data was analyzed at Greenwich. We know this from the letters between them. I think I won't bother to read out, but if, you, if anyone wants to, we can come back. This is letters between Dyson and Eddington, which kind of confirm that Eddington wasn't involved in analyzing that data. Uh, we, we can see Dyson's handwriting in the analysis sheets and so on. It was Dyson's decision. So the real question is, was Dyson biased? And, and the answer would appear to be no. Here we have Dyson writing to a fellow astronomer afterwards. The result was contrary to my expectations, he says. And then Eddington, writing to a colleague also, says Dyson was at the time very skeptical about the theory. So like most astronomers, Dyson you know, naturally expected that Newton's theory, which had been tested so many times and always been found to be correct, even when doubted, Naturally, he expected that this theory was going to win out again. So he was surprised it would seem that what happened. This is a family scene, incidentally, showing Eddington playing chess with his mother and his sister looking on. Uh, he played a lot of chess. We know from his letters home, he played a lot of chess on the ships on the way to the island. Well, I noticed a very small clue in the report. Uh, Dyson mentions that if they did the data analysis differently, they actually got quite a different result for those difficult plates of 1.52 seconds of arc. Um, what does that mean? Well, uh, it turns out that uh, you can look in the data analysis notes and see what they did. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip all that detail because it's probably too much. Uh, but you know, here's, here's a sort of a schematic and it shows the positions of the stars in the eclipse. And, th and that's the kind of deflection you would expect, except greatly exaggerated. It's much smaller than this, but the stars would be shifted further away. And they had to carefully measure that in a particular way. And I'm not going to bore you with the details. Um, but when I went to the Cambridge University Library to see their data analysis sheets, Julia, remember the real astronomer in the family, uh, suggested to me that I should ask about 
accessing the old plates, the original plates from the expeditions, and maybe they could be remeasured with modern equipment and reanalyzed with modern computers. Remember in 1919, the computer was Davidson. He was a person, not a machine. Right? Well, now we could do more. Uh, and so I asked, and I was told, by well, luckily, very luckily, I asked the right person. He said, oh yes, that was done in the 1979, and everybody else in the world had forgotten this, but he remembered. And so I tracked down the people, I tracked down the paper, and it turns out that yes, the Royal Greenwich Observatory in the 70s had done exactly what Julia suggested. They took out the old plates, they remeasured them on a plate measuring machine, they reanalyzed them with modern astrometric data reduction software on a computer, and they published their results in the observatory. And this unfortunately sank without trace. No one else had ever referenced this paper until I was lucky enough to find it because of this tip off. Uh, so here is what they got. So here's a table, and you can see on the left the three different telescopes, uh, two from Sobral, one from Principe. Let's focus on the Sobral one. We have the 1919 results, which I've already given you, much larger, more like Einstein for the four-inch, much smaller, more like Newton for the astrographic. There's an alternative result, which they put forward, and then there's the results of the reanalysis on the right column. You can see it agrees very closely with the 1919 result for the four-inch, 1.9 seconds of arc versus 1.98. But the reanalysis doesn't agree with the original value from the astrographic at Sobral, but it does agree with their alternative result. And this, I was very interested to see because I had become convinced that their alternative result, although they didn't like to talk about it because they didn't want to seem like they were trying to draw too much out of data. I'm convinced from looking at their data analysis sheets that that was what convinced them that the original result they got from the astrographic was all wrong. I can talk more about the data analysis if you guys are interested. Uh, but just if you want to get a look, these are what the sheets look like. This is the actual uh, uh, scan of one of the actual data analysis sheets. This is actually the page on which Dyson, this is his handwriting, actually decides what he's going to do. He's going to throw out the astrographic results because they're inconsistent, and he's going to keep the Sobral results. And you can see it's Dyson's handwriting, it's not any. Uh, so, uh, the logic of the situation clarified, actually, I think I'm going to skip that's more a little more detail than I want, but I just want to emphasize here, the alternative result from 1919 is a deflection alpha of 1.52 seconds of arc. The reanalysis in 1979 interestingly agrees very, very, and I believe Tellingly agrees very closely with that. Um, so hooray for Dyson. Uh, I believe that he did a, made it a good call. Uh, he had very good sound reasons for doing so. We know that Davidson as soon as he developed some of the plates on, uh, in Sobral, he actually said right away in his diary and communicated it back to Dyson. He said, I don't think we can get much out of these astrographic plates because the astigmatism is too bad. So it wasn't that they waited until they did reduce the data and then said, oh yeah, I don't like that result. Right at the beginning, they said, there's something bad, there's something wrong with these plates. Well, of course, it wasn't the last word at the same time. There was enough doubt that obviously people were gonna do this experiment again. The next available eclipse was in 1922. This is a picture of the astrographic telescope from Greenwich, now back at the eclipse, this time on Christmas Island in the Indian Ocean. And you'll notice this time they brought all the gear, the whole uh, equatorial mounting and everything. And uh, to no avail, they were totally clouded out. Uh, but the Lick Observatory team, uh, I mentioned that here, I guess on this slide, the Lick Observatory team at a different location got excellent data totally agreed with the results from 1919. So that sort of settled the issue in most people's minds. Um, so this is a picture of the equipment from 1919, now on display at Dunsink Observatory in Dublin. That's the lens in the, at the front, and then that's the Celestat mirror in the, 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 with the big green mounting. Um, Einstein had, when he first uh, sort of uh, uh, developed general relativity and realized that the mercury perihelion result was correct. He had written to a friend, he said, how helped we are by the pedantic precision of astronomers, which I had often secretly poked fun at. So he was in the end very grateful to the astronomers and here he was very grateful to the astronomers again because they had uh, done him proud. Um, so it's, I think, inarguably one of the most famous, um, one of the most important experiments of the 20th century and a very important era, a century for physics and astronomy. Um, the, uh, it made Einstein world famous. It demonstrated, as Eddington put it, that light has weight and that space-time is curved. And it uh, 
led, of course, to many, many more dramatic discoveries based on general relativity that even Einstein didn't anticipate in 1919, like black holes and gravitational waves he had anticipated, but he was a, li a little uncertain about them, and now we're very, very confident that they exist. So to a considerable extent, that was all made possible by this team from 1919, and I feel like I'm very happy to have uh, come to their defense because I feel like they've been rather unjustly accused uh, in recent times. So thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, are That's there good. questions? Two great presentations, wonderful presentations. Thank you, Doctor and Daryl. Yes, I don't have a question, but I do intend to buy the book now. I appreciate all the speakers tonight, and uh, it was really good. And thanks everybody for participating. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Great job. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. We want to thank you very much for your, your time tonight. We, we thoroughly thank enjoyed you. your presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank I, you. I had a great time. Thank you for having me. We, we, bye, we everybody. Did. All right. Everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. You too. Bye-bye, all. Bye. -bye,